I'm Jason Lewis. And I'm Flora Gladwin. And I'm Thomas Mills. Welcome to Climate Optimus. As a couple concerned citizens, we're on a journey to explore climate solutions and ways each of us can make a difference. And as a nonprofit focused on educating and empowering people to get involved in climate action, we rely on the financial support of our listeners. So if you're a regular listener and you value what you get from us, consider a donation that aligns with that value. Yeah, it's easy. All you have to do is head over to our website, climateoptimist.co, click the donate button. Even $5 a month goes a long way in, in helping us deliver on our mission. And as always, if you're short on money but want to help out, have your friends subscribe and make sure you rate us on your, your streaming platform. So if you're looking for an extra podcast to download for your upcoming road trip, we have a recommendation for you. When the People Decide is a podcast about how everyday people are shaping democracy and how you can too. The first season was about people who use ballot initiatives to bring issues they care about directly to their fellow voters, often bypassing state legislators who stood in their way. The second season, which is streaming now, looks at cities and towns that are strengthening democracy at a local level. Learn about how residents of Petaluma, California won the democracy lottery and how Durham, North Carolina is turning over a portion of its budget to residents to spend. The podcast is a project of the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and produced by LWC Studios. Yeah, definitely worth, worth a listen. So if it wasn't already apparent, the climate impacts of this summer have demonstrated the importance of rapidly slashing emissions and investing in helping people adapt to a warming world. And while most of the focus is rightfully on reducing emissions, well-executed adaptation is going to be critical for communities that are most vulnerable to climate impacts. In other words, we're going to need both emission reductions and thoughtful responses. So for this episode, we thought it would be worthwhile to revisit adaptation, why it's important, and what's needed for us to do it well. Before we go there, as always, we've got our reason for hope this week. And this week, that is that a group of rainforest countries has formed a pact to push for more conservation resources. It was set up at the recent Amazon Summit in Brazil. It includes a list of a dozen nations with Brazil, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Indonesia that all have critical rainforests. The goal is really securing more cash to help preserve their forests for both, you know, carbon sequestration perspective and biodiversity benefits. As part of their joint statement, they also called on rich countries to deliver on their existing commitments by providing $100 billion a year in climate finance and $200 billion a year for biodiversity preservation. In other words, live up to what you already promised. Yeah. And look, while some of these uh, countries had a bit of a uh, grizzle about the fact that the European Union was implementing uh, these carbon uh, border adjustment mechanisms, and I know it's going to make things a little bit difficult for uh, these other nations in, in the short term, but in the long term, they'll be better off because of it. Uh, and right now, the, this initial one only, is only going to cover the likes of cement, iron, steel, aluminium, fertilizer, electricity, and hydrogen, but that will be expanded in time. And I'm guessing that's what their concerns are around um, with regard to beef and other products that come out of those areas. Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way. Like we need, a, we need kind of both a carrot and a stick. And as you know, the wealthy nations of the world, we certainly need to step up and help them protect their force. But yeah, you, you got to have a stick there too. And I think if the U.S. can implement, you know, the Forest Act that we've talked about, we can get, you know, just set more of a precedent that, you know, nations aren't going to import goods from countries where deforestation is an issue. For sure. Um, I think today we we link really well, honestly, to our reason for hope with this focus on climate finance, because today we're excited to have climate scientist Dr. Lisa Shipper back with us to to revisit the topic of adaptation. As a scientist, Lisa's focus is on adaptation and vulnerability to climate change in the global south, with the goal of understanding the relationship between adaptation and development. She's especially interested in the sociocultural drivers of vulnerability, including gender, culture, and very interestingly, religion. Lisa led a chapter in the recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. She's also a professor of development geography at the University of Bonn. 
Yeah, excited to have Lisa back on the program and help us talk about what, you know, is really an important topic and one that doesn't get enough attention. Lisa, welcome to Climate Optimus. Thank you so much. So, uh, kick things off. Um, let's start with our question we do all our guests. When it comes to efforts to address climate change, what makes you hopeful? Well, to answer this question, this week is a bit tough, I would say. I mean, I think that we've had, <laughs> you know, we've just finished July, which has been the hottest month on record. And in the sort of within almost, you know, 48 hours after July ended, um, the UK prime minister has decided that they're going to open lots of new oil and gas licenses. And they're going to just sort of increase the amount of fossil fuels that are available in the system. And so it's really difficult to say, you know, that or to stay optimistic in terms of, you know, things are really, really happening. We also have evidence from um, um, attribution scientists that some of these heat waves I've been seeing have been and would never have been as bad if it hadn't been for climate change. And so, you know, then on the other hand, to see governments, influential, important governments around the world reacting as if that news doesn't matter at all. And, you know, that, that really, that's really uh, distressing. But at the same time, I think what really makes me kind of hopeful is how many people are aware of climate change. And even those people who currently are denying and who keep saying, oh, it's just summer and so on, at least they know, you know, they've heard, they must have it in their minds. And I'm, I'm convinced that, you know, they just want to kind of walk their party line and they just want to say what others in their in their community are saying because they don't want to seem like um, woke lefties. But I think that actually a lot of people are recognizing, even in those communities, that, that wow, things are not great. And there must be some something to this that the scientists are talking about, but they just don't want to vocalize it yet. And so that makes me hopeful. I mean, that, that you know, after having worked on climate change for the last, uh, God, long time now, um, <laughs> 25 years, more than 25 years, I think it's really the, the, you know, now we can say, you can talk about climate change and everybody knows what I'm referring to. So that, that is what makes me hopeful because the more different kinds of people are aware of that, the, the, the higher the chance of actually getting, putting the, the pressure on governments to act and governments and, and to regulate companies um, who are responsible for a lot of these problems as well. And I appreciate you acknowledging sort of that that struggle, right, of there are these events unfolding and yet we have, while we do have, you know, places and, and actions that governments are taking are positive, there still seems to be sometimes this complete disconnect between you know, the reality and the urgency of the situation and, and what they're doing. And well, let's, for those who might not be familiar with climate adaptation, maybe you've heard of the term, but don't know what it means. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what is adaptation and, and why it's, it's so important? So climate change adaptation is basically the process of adjusting to these impacts of climate change. We talk about them both as the impacts that we experience, but also the impacts that we expect in the future so that we can plan things like making sure we have early warning systems where there, when there are storms coming to rethinking the way that we construct housing and especially things like hospitals or schools to either make sure that they're you know storm proof or that they are um, better set up and, uh, so that when it gets really hot so that we can actually have you know they're, not, they're cool places so that children can continue to go to school and not stay home like um, schools in India that have recently been closing in the last two years because it's been too hot and the children can't be there any longer but it's also things like you know ensuring that there's better better training or education so that people who for example are in very climate exposed livelihoods like farmers can actually say okay this doesn't work for me but here i have access to some kind of other uh, training that will allow me to to you know give me some other skills so i can have another job uh, so all of these these types of things uh when we talk about adaptation we don't always know you know, when I say it, you don't know what I mean. And when you say it, I don't always know what you have in mind. And so part of the the lack of progress uh, globally has been, and I think also locally, is this sort of relative confusion about is it something that we just kind of add on or improve on something that we're currently doing? Or is adaptation about 
completely transforming the way that we do things. In fact, even kind of upending entire um, institutions or organizations or, you know, political setups. And right now, there's a lot of discussion about this concept of transformation or transformational adaptation, which is essentially when we think we have to change everything. We can't do, we can't follow this development path any longer. We can no longer for certain countries in Africa, for example, though where agriculture is very, very important for the economy, maybe shifting completely away from that. And what are the other options then? I mean, that's, that's really challenging. So it, it is a, it's a broad concept, but it's basically about how we're going to behave, change, do things as the climate is changing so that we are not adversely affected. Right. <clears throat> and that can take the form of sounds like things big and small and, and, you know, knowledge to physical infrastructure. So very, very big umbrella. Well, and you've alluded to this already, are there certain sort of regions or types of areas that where the need for adaptation is more urgent, right? I mean, you were mentioning the idea of places in Africa no longer, you know, being able to rely on you know, agriculture, like whether because of changing, I'm guessing, rain patterns or heat or what have you. I think that we could say that there are certain there are certain uh, lives livelihoods. I mean, there are certain jobs that simply are more exposed, and in certain countries, there there or regions, they're they're more likely to be exposed. So obviously, farming has always been risky for everybody, and farming continues to be risky and will will always be. But you know, this is where farmers know that this year I can't plant maize. I haven't you know last year wasn't enough rain. It's very thirsty crop. Maybe I'm not going to plant that again. I don't know if, what it's going to be like. I'll plant something that isn't as thirsty. But I think, you know, in general, where are the places where people have to worry the most about climate change? It's along coasts. So obviously, small islands would be the ones where we really need to think about, you know, is it possible to adapt? And so here we hit up often against the limits to adaptation because there is only so much you can do. I mean, one of the, the strategies for coastal adaptation is moving away from the coast. And so you, right. you know, but that requires options. I mean, that requires you to have a place to go. But also in very small islands, you're not going to be able to get away from the coast really that easily. So here you have to think a little bit about, you know, am I have, do I have to leave? And the idea of migration is often described as an adaptation strategy. And I think that's fair, but it, it's also to some extent the last resort. The knowledge that we have on adaptation and these limits adaptation is really important as well, because when we, what we now know about adaptation is that it's very, very strongly linked also to global warming levels. Because after, for example, 1.5 degrees, a lot of adaptation strategies are no longer as effective. And in some cases, they're not at all, they don't work any longer. So the example that we in, in the IPCC that we give is small islands after 1.5, there won't be any fresh water available to drink any longer. And people need fresh water, obviously. So that is a hard limit where there's no option. Also in mountain areas that rely on, on snow melt or glacial melt, uh, when there's no longer any snow and there's, the glaciers are gone, that's another limit. They can't get water any longer. So it's, you know, so I would say still the, the poorer countries are still the ones where we need to think the most about adaptation because that's where the impacts are the worst. But at the same time, that's also where I think we're hitting up against these limits to how effective adaptation can be. So it's, it's a bit tricky to say kind of at this point, you know, and I think I have talked to, to people who are asking, like, is adaptation no longer possible? Um, and I think that we have to be really careful because if we make those kinds of statements, it suggests that we're going to give up and not, not try any longer. But I think we also, at the same time, have to be realistic about these limits and what that means. And I'm guessing, you know, a lot of times those decisions may be very local based and in, in consideration of the people that are impacted and, and their limitations rather than sort of this rule book of here's what we do in these different situations. Unfortunately, though, that, that book, I mean, I think that, that the blueprints come out over and over again. And so if you're talking about, for example, uh, when development actors are the ones doing adaptation projects, so, you know, sort of using their, their structure for the way that they do development aid, what we see is that a lot of these projects are just things that they've done elsewhere and they want to apply in a, in a different location because they don't understand the local context. So you alluded to this a minute ago, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about sort of the relationship between climate adaptation, as we're talking about it, and, and climate justice, um, especially yeah. in the global south. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this plays out 
on multiple levels. It plays out in the the policy processes for kind of when we decide what counts as adaptation. So, for example, in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Negotiations, the global negotiations that have a huge impact on what kind of adaptation gets financed and and who gets the money. And the the discussions there are very rarely ask sort of whose resilience, you know, who, whose resilience is being built and you know, how are we differentiating between making sure that these projects are actually effective and going to the people who need the, the most help? The policy process isn't clear on that. And in, in, as a consequence, the practice of actually going out and put, putting these projects into, into practice in the field also struggles because then there aren't any clear guidelines to say, well, you need to make sure that the, the most vulnerable people or the most marginalized people are actually the ones who get to benefit or maybe it says that, but it doesn't say how you identify those people. And so, you know, it, it, it is a very much, as I was saying, sort of this process where an outside actor comes in and the, ins, the, the local people very rarely have any opportunity to speak up. And so we see that that context often results in maladaptation when adaptation makes people more vulnerable than, than, than less vulnerable. And that's really a problem because the external people could have done some homework and they could have made sure that they talked to the local people. And they, but it also takes a lot more time, and therefore it does take more resources from the perspective of the external people who come with the money. So it's sort of these obvious problems, these obvious barriers that, that we know they're there, and for some reason they're, they're just not getting addressed very well. So there is this concept of locally-led adaptation that is supposed to try to turn this on its head and to try to ensure that there is more climate justice. There is, it's fair, those people who need the help will actually get the help and not just external actors coming to the local, to, to sorry, to the national government who then, you know, give the money to anybody who is on their, in the same party or who, you know, to the, the areas that voted for them or whatever, and not to the ones who didn't vote for them who are probably going to be the ones who actually need more help. You know, traditionally, we talk about climate justice, it's about thinking about how the fact that those people who cause the emissions are not the one, you know, the rich people who cause the emissions are not the ones who are getting the worst uh, impact. The people who are getting the worst impacts are the ones who, the poorest and often marginalized or, you know, for, and I should say, I mean, it is just like in the history of environmental justice, often very much kind of racism and other kinds of, of um, issues that underlie this. So... It sounds like a big component regardless in all this. It's like even sort of well-intended actions from wealthy countries or expertise, there needs to be this this exchange of ideas and, and dialogue at a, at a local level. So we come in with good intentions, but we're actually leaving something behind that, that is beneficial and helps, you know, helps them advance as opposed to creating additional problems. So, you know, talking about money a little bit, wondering, you know, just at a macro level, what kind of funding has been estimated to sort of need to be needed to to support adaptation? Well, I mean, there is a figure that that is kind of estimated five hundred billion U.S. dollars, but I think that is a complete underestimation because, I mean, the reality is that how do we define adaptation? So, if we say, okay, adaptation is about you know all farmers having drought-proof corn. Um, seeds or, you know, like all these kinds of better tools and technology, but we know how much those things cost. So we can make an estimate of how much all that costs. But actually, a lot of adaptation is much more complicated, as I was saying, you know, it's about identifying who is the most vulnerable. Most of the root causes of vulnerability are really challenging to address. It's about gender inequity. It's about, you know, racism, like I said earlier, it's about other kinds of political marginalization. How would you put a figure, uh, you know, amount of money uh, on how to resolve those issues? If you don't resolve those issues, you are unlikely to be able to adapt because the people will be continue to be vulnerable, they'll continue to be marginalized, and they won't be able to adapt to climate change. So we have a sense of most funding goes to um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I I have to say, I think it should because we really need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because as we know, if we don't, we also won't be able to adapt. You know, but it is, it's, it's somewhat disproportionate. I mean, it's a really significantly huge amount more that goes to mitigation. Um, sorry, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but, you know, for me, the money isn't the real problem. It's the real, the real problem is how do we do adaptation better? So even if we have 500 billion US dollars, 
you know, if we spend 400 billion on bad adaptation projects, that's a lot of wasted money. And so I think we, you know, we could probably be much more effective if we actually address these problems, if we kind of unpacked it in a way that we knew if we're going to come from external actors, it must be working with local. You have to collaborate with local actors. And, you know, climate plans that are done, for example, in cities in the U.S., adaptation plans, they can't just be outsourced to consultancies. They need to be integrated with, you know, communities, with, with local governments and so on. So what I'm hearing is, let's not focus on the money per se, like that, that can be a place that often gets attention, but let's focus on how do we do adaptation better so that regardless of what funding streams are coming in, they're going to the right things. And they're addressing maybe most importantly, the things that made these communities vulnerable in the first place and that climate change is just exacerbating. So if you were to sort of say like, what are Lisa's top three things to making adaptation better, right? Well, what are the things I'm hearing being able to collaborate more at a local level? Are, are there other sort of key elements to doing yeah. adaptation better? Yeah. So starting with vulnerability and really understanding what is making people vulnerable to climate change and recognizing the differentiated nature of that. That is, who is the most vulnerable, who, you know, and, and why? You know, that was number one. And then, you know, in order to understand that, you need to make sure that it's locally driven. I think that's probably the two things. Um, maybe one other thing is making sure that we understand what adaptation is and that there's a kind of bigger collective acknowledgement that there are these many, many different interpretations of adaptation. Is The problem is that we end up with these metrics or these attempts to assess kind of have we done the right thing. Uh, this is, for example, a huge discussion in the, in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. What they need to do is they need to figure out how do we measure our progress towards this global goal? And that includes understanding how adaptation is assessed and creating kind of metrics for it. And to me, this is nonsense because, you know, I know that they need it to be able to d decide how much money is supposed to go where and to be able to track whether the money is working, whether, you know, things in this big policy structure that they have. But that process is flawed because we, you know, we can't measure how effective adaptation is. It takes a long time to be able to see whether it's worked or not. And it also, by putting so much emphasis on the outcome, we don't put enough emphasis on the planning process going in. That's where I would like to see more metrics. Like, are we, you know, is it locally driven? Is it, um, or locally led? Is it locally designed? Is it, you know, is it implemented locally? Can we ensure that we look from, you know, on the, the input side in, is vulnerability the, the, the starting point for, for this adaptation strategy? I mean, that, that makes sense because I guess inevitably what you measure drives where you focus. And if you're not measuring some of the things that are essential to a good adaptation project, then, you know, people are going to not pay attention to those things. So, well, are there, as we kind of think about the state of adaptation, are there, you know, countries or organizations that are kind of leading when it comes to implementing adaptation? I guess a good examples, if you will. I think that there are those organizations that that are kind of grassroots or at least work very, very closely with grassroots, with local communities, but also understand the international policy process. Those seem to be the ones that are have the 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 best chance of really uh, helping communities adapt well. So I would say there are, for example, the International Institute of Envir Environment and Development in London, I would say is one of these organizations. It's a it's a, a think tank, a, a research institute, uh, but they work very much with local leaders. They work uh, also very much in the international and you know the international policy processes and national policy processes around the world. Uh, they also work to help uh, build capacity of negotiators in the UN process. So those negotiators from the least developed countries can go into the negotiations and understand all these big concepts and all these processes and be able to stand up for themselves and say, hey, we need the funding because of X, Y, Z. And so to me, uh, that's really an ideal organization. I'm making advertisement for them. I do know a lot of people there. So <laughs> I, it, it, I have never worked there myself. But I do think that 
you know, if there's one organization that stands out to me in terms of, of work on adaptation, um, I think that that's a model to that, that other organizations should follow as well. It's not easy. They've been worked doing this for decades. So they have really established uh, networks and contacts. And one other point, I think maybe that's coming to mind as we're talking about all of this that needs to be kept, I think, in the greater context is what you mentioned in terms of mitigation, which is we want to get better at how we do adaptation so we have better outcomes. Um, but we also need to bear in mind that adaptation, even if it's done well, um, has in some cases limitations. And so we need to address our greenhouse gas emission problem and you know, more broadly our consumption problem and growth problem if we're going to be successful. Absolutely. I mean, this is, you know, so it comes back to this. And I would argue that that isn't, um, and I'm not sure if I said that last time, but, but I think that one of the, the, for me, the kind of big aha, uh, having worked on adaptation for so long, it we very, very rarely spoke about it in the context of any kind of global warming levels. Like who, how would we do that? Like we, in how would you understand? So we did talk about limits to adaptation. Often it was like, oh, money is a limit and education is a limit. And it, it was really when the IPCC was asked to do the re- special report looking at 1.5 degrees that adaptation scientists rapidly, rapidly had to come up with some research to figure out what do we know from on our, you know, about adaptation under certain global warming levels. And I would say that knowledge is still kind of in its kind of early days, but we're it's really clear that um, now that the limits to how much we can adapt as we hit 1.5 even now, but 1.5 and then kind of beyond that, we're really looking at kind of that that loss of effectiveness. I should say 1.5 degrees refers to the global average. You know, it's very frightening to think about that. I would say there's some people who are perpetuating the myth that adaptation is endless, that we can actually continue to adapt. So, you know, you see these skeptics and they say, oh, you know, we'll adapt to that. And there was recently an article that I saw people were making fun of, um, and I think a good measure that we, we can adapt to heat. Well, yeah, over a long period of time, maybe. I mean, obviously, you know, some people live in really hot climates and other people have a really hard time when they visit those climates, like people from Sweden going to Thailand, for example. But we're not going to be able to adapt to, you know, or over, what is it, I can't remember exactly what, what the limit is, but something like 48 degrees or something Celsius where we just can't, how many hours can you be in that heat? So I think that, you know, this is, this is a myth that we can continue to adapt. It's really important to repeat that. Um, so therefore, the greenhouse gas emission reduction is critical. Right. Well, and, and, and I think it, it does feel like as we're talking about all this, you know, as I'm taking it in, it's like there's sort of this this important balancing act of not losing sight of the urgency of action, still being thoughtful about the types of actions that we're taking, that, that it isn't, you know, lost hope, recognizing that there are limitations to all of this and that, that we need to act in order to, to avoid these scenarios where it doesn't matter, you know, that we don't have the, the ways to adapt, right? I guess this so sort of all leads to how, how can we as individuals who are concerned about climate change and want to see us continue to move in the right direction how can we how can we help and and maybe that's a really difficult question but interested in your in your perspective well i mean i think as individuals we're consumers and so if we know for example that you know it's summertime and we all want to have strawberries and um suddenly it's not possible to have strawberries any longer because it hasn't rained enough and can't irrigate uh you know and so on um then we can't ask for strawberries and you know as an individual that's something that you can do is say okay well you know, I'm not going to go to the supermarket and demand and buy all these things that I know are coming from far away. I mean, from in California, it's not so bad. You can get um, things. I mean, if we are eating avocados here in Germany, that's, you know, they're not, they're not local. And so, you know, right. those are the kinds of things that, that, um, that we can, can do. And that's more from a kind of a consumer perspective. The other thing, I guess, is also changing our attitudes about, you know, what, you know, what do we need in our lives? I mean, do we, you know, if we're going to build, I mean, you know, for a long time in California, there was, if you got rid of your lawn, you could get some kind of benefit. Um, and, you know, I can't remember how much it was. You know, those kinds of incentives, I think, they also help to change attitudes. Like, oh, it doesn't need, you know, my perfect house doesn't have to have a green lawn in front of it, for example. Um, right. So, you know, I mean, I do, I do think that actually those kinds of things can, you know, attitude is a huge, huge one. I think in terms of like recognizing that our behavior has to change 
and therefore, you know, it has to start from inside. How should land be developed? How should I vote so that we can assure that we're really thinking about all of these issues and that we're not excluding groups who are more exposed, uh, more likely to be exposed and, and more likely to be uh, to need adapting. So I think that's, that's the kind of thing I would, I would say an individual uh, can do. And I don't want to put too much burden on the individual because at the end of the day, Reducing greenhouse gas emissions is, is kind of the best, the most effective adaptation. And then um, then government really has to help with figuring out how to plan things. But, you know, we are also in many, many countries around the world, we're voters. And so we can, that's where we can have our influence. So there's maybe both a, a personal component in that we can be an example for those around us. And we all probably in our own local environment recognize things that are maybe less sustainable. And then, yeah, the voting piece, obviously essential too, that we're all sort of active members of our democracy and making sure that, you know, we're holding, holding power to account, if you will. Yeah. And we're not, I mean, and I should say, I mean, I don't know, you know, that's not an option for some people around the world either. And, and some, it's not an option for people who live in some of the most exposed countries, unfortunately. But, um, but I mean, I think, you know, for those of us who do have those options, we really, really need to take advantage uh, and, and think about, you know, how how can we, how can we get our decision makers to actually do something that is going to help? You know, we, we do have power there. Well, Lisa, uh, thanks for coming on and, and joining us again to talk more about adaptation. Um, always, you know, new learnings and things that I that I didn't know that, and and appreciate you being able to convey, you know, the complexity of it, but at the same time, the value it has and, and the fact, therefore, we shouldn't be we get giving up on it. So, yeah, thanks thanks for coming on and, and, of course, appreciate all the work you're doing in the space. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me again. So before we get into kind of what you guys thought about the interview with Lisa, I feel like I had to kind of jump on the fact that this made me think of the Reuters investigation that that took place back in in early June, where they talked about some of the you know problematic investments that have been made, um, where you know in the name of climate that you know really fit into that maladaptation category that, that uh, Lisa was talking about, and there was a whole host of them. Yeah, I I was cracking up reading the article because they call climate finance, the Wild West, basically anything goes. Um, and that's really clear when you get further into it. Some of the wildest examples that we were finding included Japan and the U.S.'s investments. Uh, on Japan's part, they spent $2.4 billion in lending to build a new coal-fired power plant in Bangladesh, um, which is obviously not a climate-friendly investment uh, and $167 million in lending to finance an airport expansion in Egypt. <laughs> so, wild. yeah, I know. I mean, honestly, shocking stuff. I I kind of couldn't believe it as I was reading. And the coal plant, there's some stats in the, in the article speaking more specifically to its actual emissions. And they had calculated that there will be about 6.8 million tons of CO2 that are emitted by this coal plant every year, which is more than the entire city of San Francisco produced in 2019. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. I I think, as Lisa rightfully points out, you know we've got to be careful with how we talk about these examples. Like we need to shine a light on them because obviously we need to you know amend how we're investing this money. But at the same time, we don't want to imply that all adaptation is bad because clearly there are countries you know that really need it. I mean, you know, to me, adaptation is really really about, you know, framing, to me, adaptation is really, in essence, you know, rich countries stepping up to help, you know, fix what they've broken. You know, you've got the US, the EU and China together, you know, 60% of historical greenhouse gas emissions. And then on the flip side, you know, you've got countries in Africa that, um, that haven't even had a climate impact, you know, and nations in the global South are really paying the price. I mean, there was a, an article and we'll link this uh, in the Guardian that was talking about how there are 11 African nations that have done the least to contribute to climate change are now facing, you know, adaptation costs that are greater than what they're spending on healthcare. So it just, yeah, just illustrates the the magnitude of the problem. So yes, we don't want maladaptation. And as Lisa talked about, 
you know, there's some important process improvements in there that need to take place. Um, but yes, we still need to do adaptation given we have these vulnerable countries that, that are really just, you know, facing climate impacts that, that we've caused. Yeah. I think that's a really good point, Jason. Um, and I thought that Lisa kind of had these, these two arguments that I kept going back to as I was listening to this. The first being this key point around not just replacing, but rethinking, um, which I'm sure we can talk about more. And also this idea, I think she said, I think the specific words were doing your homework and talking to local people, which I loved. (laughs) I thought that was a really good way to put it. And yeah, I found a couple examples of successful climate adaptation projects just because I feel like there are so many examples of maladaptation historically. And I think they're, you know, great to be conscious of, but yeah, we got to you know, highlight the good stuff too. Yeah. Climate optimists, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the two that I found that I thought were really interesting, the first was in Latin America, where indigenous groups can receive funding through the Pawanka Fund to promote sustainable living and land management by prioritizing indigenous knowledge and traditional modes of agriculture. So one of the projects that, you know, used this fund was in Belize, where Mayan communities actually used this Inga tree alley cropping method, which is a traditional approach that enriches nutrients in the soil and also prevents unnecessary clearing of the land. So kind of relying more on traditional forms of indigenous knowledge. And then another cool example of successful adaptation that really was focused at the local level is Bangladesh's Climate Bridge Fund, which specifically supports climate migrants. So It funds long-term adaptation projects, which are driven by those who have been disproportionately affected by climate change. I thought both of those were just really great examples that it can be done well, but you need transparency and you you need local input. Yeah, totally agree. What about you, Thomas? Well, I mean, along those lines, I'm I'm all for local input too, but I, I think we've still got to make sure that there's good oversight of these projects so that we, you know, limit the risk of any mm-hmm. corruption or what have you that might cause these the, the reputation of these adaptation projects to get tarnished in the future. Oh, actually. Okay, so they're already tarnished, but getting worse than it currently is. <laughs> but, but but anyway, at, yes. at a more local level though, like I think that th- there's sort of adaptation going on all around us. In fact, I was, I've just been working on a project recently with a nursing home where they had um, gas heating throughout this entire facility, but no air conditioning in the, in the uh, residents' rooms. And so converting that facility over from gas heating to he- uh, split system heat pumps has reduced the carbon emissions by about three quarters. But at the same time, it's improved the quality of life of those residents because now in summer, they have the ability to have some cooling in their rooms. So where you get that synergy between you know, climate resilience and improved quality of life, I think is like such a great union. And keeping our eye out for projects where we can get that is, is something that's always on my radar. I think another one that I see too at a at a more global level, is how these cities in Northern Europe, like Paris and Amsterdam, are going, right, well, let's go and remove the parking in the city and let's turn those areas into like green zones or put them back to bike lanes and things like that, where you get uh, an adaptation of the city in that now the place is cooler because you've got the evaporative cooling from the trees, but at the same time, the emissions associated with people traveling back and forth to work is significantly less because we've made it so much easier for them to use a means of transport that is way more efficient than driving a, a vehicle. So again, another one where you get those common synergies, you improve people's quality of life and you make the city more resilient at the same time. So I think that's a good call out, Thomas. You know, the the reality is um, we need to be, you know, helping vulnerable countries out and and vulnerable folks in our own communities as well. So definitely places to plug in and and do adaptation. You know, anywhere you are. I, I think the other piece that that stood out to me was sort of this idea, this myth about humans' ability to just continuously adapt. And I think it's mm. worth calling out because. I know there's been dialogue, you know, in sort of the climate denier or, you know, dismissive space where, you know, people talk about how, well, hey, you know, climate change is going to happen, but it's not going to be that bad and we can just adjust. And and that's simply not the case. I mean, we have 
the ability to adjust if we cut our emissions, you know, keep things under, you know, one and a half degrees Celsius. But if things continue, you know, status quo, there's no amount of adaptation that's going to, you know, to take care of us. Yeah. And I think it's important too, like we, we always hear them talk about this whole, you know, 1.1 or 1.5 degree mean average temperature shift and things like that. When, when you look at the impact on agriculture, which really affects some of these developing nations, it's not so much that mean shift. It's the fact that the, the, the standard distribution gets widened significantly. So, you know, all of a sudden your fruit crop ends up getting hit by a frost um, late in the season uh, when everything had already blossomed and next thing is you've lost all your fruit for the entire year. There are things like that that uh, go to cause problems that we've got to make sure that you know, we, we keep pushing for the actual CO2 emission reduction and don't just think that we can keep adapting forever. Yeah, I agree, Thomas. I think you know when we're talking about the numbers, it's easy to get sort of fixed on this idea of like, you know, whatever the target, one and a half degrees Celsius or staying under two degrees Celsius and thinking about that in absolute terms when, when really what, what's important are the extremes, you know. So naturally, as we're talking about adaptation and, and the need to see it done well and see more of it, uh, it leads to sort of the question of, of what can we do? So admittedly, while, you know, helping adaptation around the world can be more challenging, we want to focus on mitigation this week instead, given that mitigation is you know one of the best forms of adaptation. And so I want everybody to call your representatives and lean on them to do more to mitigate climate change. You know, there are perfect catalysts for a conversation or or an email or a message everywhere right now. You know, you've got the the fires in Hawaii, you've got the, you know, heat that was in Phoenix where, you know, they had over 30 days, over 110 degrees. There's plenty of ways to tee up and emphasize the need for more robust climate action. We'll have talking points on on our website, but, you know, let's all get out there and do our part. You know, being a silent majority on this isn't going to do anything to solve climate change. We need to be speaking out. So any additional thoughts on uh, pushing our representatives for, for climate action, guys? I think you summed it up well. I'm just terrified of the heat. I mean, it's hitting... 109 in Portland this week, which is not even that bad compared to many places in the world. But I'm I'm definitely freaked out. And I, I do think it's just a great chance to call on your representatives. Yeah. And, and the best part is it gives you a reason to be hopeful. I think when I'm mm-hmm. feeling down about climate change, the best way to feel better is to is to get out there and take action. So use the heat as your, you know, your catalyst to get involved and Yeah, just leave a simple message and that's all it takes. Well, that's a wrap for this week's episode. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. And for those of you who want more emails they can look forward to in your inbox, consider signing up for our monthly newsletter. We keep it uh, short on fluff and heavy on substance. Whether you're looking for some cool climate talking points for that next barbecue or meaningful ways to fight climate change, it's a great source. Climate Optimus is made possible by Climate Stewards Collective. You can find us on the web at climateoptimist.co. And don't forget to follow us on social at Climate Optimist Podcast. Mm-hmm.